द नेक्स्ट फ्यू एपिसोड ऑफ बिल्डिंग ब्लॉक्स ऑफ भारत वी विल एक्सप्लोर अ रेंज ऑफ डिफरेंट मटीरियल यूज फॉर कंस्ट्रक्शन एंड वॉट बेटर वे टू स्टार्ट दैन विथ ब्रिक्स Bricks are one of the oldest known building materials in the world, dating back to 7000 BCE. Through our travels in this episode, we are going to explore different kinds of bricks, the advantages of using bricks, as well as a range of buildings built with brick, starting with the Harappan civilization and ending with colonial India. Let's start off with a quick look at pre-Harappan architecture. Through this period, unbaked mud brick or adobe was used extensively. This practice continued through the Harappan civilization when stone was not used very much. One of the early sites that used bricks was Mehergarh, now located in Balochistan in Pakistan. This site dates to Neolithic times around 3000 BCE. Residents here lived in mud brick houses. Even tombs here were made of bricks. But why are bricks such a critical building block of architecture? Well, bricks gave ancient builders a number of advantages over rocks and other material they used. Bricks are made of natural material, clay and shale, both of which are found abundantly. They also provide protection from weather, fire, and are durable. They are strong with good compression strength which is the capacity to withstand loads tending to reduce size and perhaps most importantly the advent of bricks provided humans with the ability and flexibility to construct structures in places where rock was unavailable In cities of the Harappan civilization like Dholavira, Harappa and Mohenjo-daro, burnt bricks and unburnt sun-dried bricks were used. The mud bricks were kept out for several days to several weeks to dry, depending on local temperatures. In places where access to timber was possible, these bricks were fired inside a kiln. The fire in the kiln heated or fired the bricks at a high temperature to make them very hard these fired bricks were found to be more resistant to harsher weather conditions which made them a much more reliable brick for use in permanent buildings the fact that many of these bricks are still found in excellent condition supporting structures thousands of years later is testament to the material's durability how mud bricks were used we travel to an ancient excavation at a village called panchmata in rajasthan here archaeologists are hard at work to uncover the secrets of a hard culture which date back to the 2nd and 3rd century bce this civilization existed at the same time as the harappan and even had trade links with them Here archaeologists from India and the United States are carefully excavating the earth in well defined trenches to unearth layers of habitation. It's here that they have been able to find many mud brick walls. Interestingly, each of these bricks is over a kilo and a half in weight. 
They are as solid as stone. In some sites like Mohenjo-daro and Tali Banga, wedge-shaped bricks were also found. These were used to line brick walls of the wells. Bricks were laid in rows or courses, end-to-end -end and crossways, using wet mud as cement to stick the bricks together. In Harappan cities, in the portion of the buildings where contamination with water was possible, burnt bricks were used. For other parts, sun-dried bricks were used. Interestingly, most bricks found in Harappan sites for domestic structures are 7 by 14 by 28 centimeters. If we translate this into a mathematical ratio, this is 1 is to 2 is to 4 while bricks which lined town walls and platforms are 10 by 20 by 40 centimeters. Again, the ratio remains 1 is to 2 is to 4. However, in few sites like Kali Banga, the ratio of the bricks was 1 is to 2 is to 3. Homes had indoor and outdoor kitchens and were made of fired or sun-dried bricks. The staircases of big buildings were solid, the roofs were flat and were made of wood. For the towns near the seas like Lothal, inhabitants learned that fired brick was more impervious to tidal waters. Each city in the region was surrounded by a brick wall, which helped control trade and flooding. From the Harappan civilization, let us move to a site associated with the Buddha. This takes us 12 kilometers from the holy city of Varanasi to Sarnath. Sarnath is the site of the Deer Park where Gautam Buddha first taught the Dharma after his enlightenment. It is one of the four holy Buddhist sites sanctioned by the Buddha himself for pilgrimage. The monument we are keen on exploring, the Chokhandi Stoop. It is one of the first monuments you see in Sarnath. This stoop is believed to have originally been a terraced temple, built during the Gupta period, which is between the 4th to 6th century. This was erected to mark the place where Lord Buddha met his first disciples who were travelling from Bodhgaya to Sarnath. It is also a great example on the evolving construction techniques and the flexibility that brick provided both in terms of shape and size as rocks were not abundantly available in this area. The octagonal tower on the top of the ancient stoop was added during the medieval period. This was built by Govardhan, the son of Raja Todarmal, the finance secretary in Akbar's court. It is supposed to commemorate the visit of Emperor Humayun, the father of Emperor Akbar. The event is recorded in Arabic in a stone tablet above the doorway on the north side. Today, the stoop is a high earthen mound covered with a brickwork edifice topped by an octagonal tower. Now before we head to our next location, let us take a quick detour to a brick-making facility to see how bricks are put together and why they last so very long. The techniques to make brick have largely remained the same since Harappan times. And like the ancient Harappans, bricks are still made with the two most abundant materials on earth, clay and shale. And very simply, it involves five steps. The first step involves preparing the clay. 
most clay will make reasonable bricks. Once clay has been dug out, it is ground and mixed with enough water to allow it to be shaped. Then the clay is mixed. Mixing is done to make the clay soil homogeneous and smooth. There are different techniques that can be used to do this, including using animal power or letting humans mix the clay with their feet. It's a bit like kneading any kind of dough. The next step is molding the bricks into blocks. Bricks should have standard characteristics if they are to be used in construction. So shaping the bricks is important. The bricks then need to dry. Water was added during clay preparation to increase workability of the mixture. But in drying, it is removed for several reasons. First, there will be less cracking in fired bricks with less water content. Second, additional fuel is needed, beyond what is used for firing, to dry the bricks in the kiln. Proper drying of bricks will involve rotating the bricks for different exposures to ensure even drying rates. For best results, drying should be done slowly. Bricks in their most primitive form were not fired, but were hardened by being dried in the sun. Sun-dried bricks were utilized for many centuries and are used even today in regions with a proper climate. The clay is then pressed into blocks and then fired. This means putting it in a furnace called a kiln and heated to approximately 1100 degrees Celsius. At these high temperatures, the clay is metamorphosed. All the water is driven off and the clay turns glossy. Here, the iron-rich minerals in the brick composition fuse together to form a strong ceramic matrix. Temperature is very important in this process. If under-fired, the bonding between the clay particles will be poor and the brick will be weak. If the temperature is too high, the bricks will melt or slump. Firing of the bricks does not actually occur in many of the small traditional brick-making plants around the world. However, when it does occur, it gives sufficient strength to the brick. Back to our next monument. This takes us to Bhitargaon, a small village in Kanpur district. We are interested in the ancient temple here. This temple dates back to the 5th century, to the Gupta period. Made of hard-baked bricks and mortar, it is an unusual structure. The front of the brick temple is terraced and fronted by a terracotta panel. The size of the bricks used here is 18 by 9 by 3 centimeters. Before exploring the temple in more detail, let us figure out what we mean by terracotta. The word itself translates to baked clay. Terracotta is made from ground clay mixed with sand or powdered fired clay. Which has enough plasticity that it can be molded into a shape. Interestingly, the techniques employed and products made out of terracotta and their utility continue to this day. For example, the ancient Harappan made terracotta drain pipes, triangular terracotta cakes and over-fired nodules. The terracotta bricks were sometimes used in bathrooms and courtyards and were used as baffles to retain heat in kilns and fireplaces. Such materials are harder and fired to a higher temperature than an ordinary clay brick would be and as such require clay of a higher quality. Terracotta has been used throughout history for sculpture and pottery as well as for bricks and roof shingles. 
In ancient times, the first clay structures were dried or baked in the sun after being formed. They were later placed in the ashes of open hearths to harden and finally kilns were used, similar to those used for pottery today. However, only after firing to high temperature would it be classified as a ceramic material. Back to our temple. It is an astonishing structure of diminishing tiers. It is raised on a platform which is 10.97 meters by 14.32 meters. It is built on a square plan with double recessed corners and faces east. There is a tall pyramidal spire over the Garbhagriha, which makes the height of the building about 20.72 meters. The walls are decorated with terracotta panels depicting both secular and religious themes such as deities like Ganesh, myths and stories representing abduction of Sita and the penance of Nar and Narayan also form a part of this panel. Here is an interesting fact. Much of this temple was restored by old bricks actually found on this site. Let's move onward and forward in time to explore one more building before we wrap this episode. This takes us to the city of Lucknow, famous for its nawabs and kebabs. We are heading to Residency, a colonial building made famous by the Great Mutiny of 1857. In 1857, the place witnessed a prolonged battle, which is also known as the Siege of Lucknow. Even today, this complex lies in the ruins it was left in after the siege. This residential complex, called Lucknow Residency, was first laid by the King Nawab Asafuddaullah of Awadh in 1775 for providing a residence to the British visitors and completed in 1800 by Nawab Sadat Ali. The whole residency complex covers 33 acres of land and comprises several buildings and gardens. You can enter through an arched gateway known as the Bailey Guard Gate. The site of residency now consists of ruins of majestic buildings Besides the main residency building, there are a range of buildings like the Sheep House, the Sikh Square, Dr. Farah's House, the Begum Koti, the Church, the Mosque, the Imam Bara, and the Native Hospital, which give an indication of the varied nature of activities within the complex. It is of great interest to look into the materials and the way they were used in Lucknow. The most common materials used were bricks and stuccos. The bricks used were Lakhori. What is a Lakhori brick? The material used was from Lahore and Lucknow. These are small sized hard baked bricks. They are dense and last well. The brickwork was done very carefully and precisely. This was to reduce the stucco work done. This is basically a kind of plaster that is applied on the outside of the bricks. The more skillful the bricklayers, the less work was there for the stuccadors, who could concentrate on delicate work instead of covering the vast area with stucco to imitate the stonework effect. Now, bricks were laid out in various patterns. These are known as bonds. Very broadly, bricks can be laid as soldiers or sailors, stretchers or headers, shiners or rowlocks. So this is the stretcher bond, 
which is an economical way of laying the bricks. And then there is the header bond. This is the English bond. This alternates headers and stretchers and is considered to be the strongest bond. It is commonly used bond for the walls of all thicknesses. There are many other bonds too. Flemish bond, stack bond and monk bond. As you can deduce, from these bonds, an infinite number of bonds can be developed. This is called the running bond and is the most used bond and is composed of stretchers offset by half brick per course. The way in which the bricks are laid affects both the appearance and strength of a building. Who would have thought that there was so much to explore about the common brick? Now bricks continued to be the predominant building material through the ages. Starting from the ancient excavations in Rajghat in Varanasi to the imposing Qutub Minar, believed to be the tallest brick minaret in the world. Though it is faced with white marble and sandstone. And for a range of other buildings, ranging from the Sanchi Stup to the Taj Mahal, to most of the colonial architecture in the country, the basic building material was the ubiquitous brick. Though often the brick was clad with other material. Even today, across modern India, brick is still used for many buildings. We've completed our journey with the humble brick, from the Harappan civilization through various other periods, right down to our modern day cities. The simplicity and the versatility of the brick has made it one of the most common building blocks of our nation and the world.